Hello, hello. I am so excited to be back with you for another episode of Thriving Together. I have to say, this particular week, I have been recording a bunch of shows for you, and I'm just really excited. I feel like there's some really juicy conversations. You know, whenever you're starting something new or you're putting yourself out there, and especially when you're doing it on your own and just kind of deciding that you're going to create an opportunity for yourself, it can feel kind of vulnerable. And I definitely think that the beginning stages of this show doing this podcast, I've just learned a lot. I think I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned more about all of you who are listening, what you like, what you're looking for more of, and all those different things. And I'm just really enjoying it right now. So I hope you're enjoying it too. If you're watching this on YouTube, I would love to hear from you. I love comments. I respond to everyone. Love, love hearing from you. And wherever you're listening to this, if you could rate, review, it just like really, really helps. Um, and it also lets me know that you're enjoying the show. And lastly, sorry to like come in with a ask, but I just feel fired up. So here we go. Um, last ask is that um, if you enjoy the show and you feel inspired to share about it on your social media, that would be awesome too, because I'm always looking for ways to grow at the show and grow like this conversation, have more people know about thriving together. And it also kind of lets me know, oh, this episode resonated and, and this is like the thing that you might have liked about it and stuff like that. So it's like good intel for me. All right. So um, without further ado, I'm going to get into to today. I am really excited about today's guest. It is this amazing woman, Amy Schoenthal. I met Amy just a couple of months ago. I haven't known her for that long. And we sort of talk about that um, in the episode, especially at the start of the episode. And I am really excited because she came out with this book. And I have to tell you, like, when I heard the title, I don't know if I immediately thought of like, oh, this is something I would necessarily read. Um, only because I don't really, the title of her book is called The Setback Cycle. And I don't feel like I'm in a particular setbacky kind of place right now. Although could be, ha could happen at any moment. But in this very moment, I was like, oh, I don't know that like, that's the book I would pick up. But what I'm super excited about and what I feel like we talked about a lot um, in the interview is just the steps and the phases um, that we go through when we are going through a setback, whether we know it's happening or not. A lot of times we're going through these things and we don't even realize it. And she just has like a lot of beautiful stories. She told me this one story in the interview um, about a famous designer. And I was literally like, my mouth was just like jaw dropped on the floor. Um, just so many things. So I really think you're going to enjoy this episode. It's like the perfect thing to listen to while you're cozying up on a Sunday or hanging out throughout your week. If you're watching it on YouTube, you know, you can hang out with us in your living room or your bedroom while you're folding laundry, whatever it is. I'm so honored always to get to be a part of your routine. So uh, love you, angels. Love you all for listening. Thank you for being here. And I hope you enjoy this episode of Thriving Together. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here with my new friend, Amy Schoenthal. Hi, Amy. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I'm so excited. I am so excited to have this conversation with you because, well, one, as I mentioned already, we're just like getting to know each other. So I feel like the podcast is always a great excuse to have people that I want to get to know more. I'm like, you should come on my podcast so I can talk to you for like 30 to 45 minutes and learn more about you. I do the same thing for my Forbes column. I'm like, you're interesting. Maybe I'll write an article yes. about you. And I just because I just kind of want to personally learn from you, which means others probably do, too. Yes, totally. I love that. Well, you and I met recently a couple of times. We met at our friend Emily Tish Sussman's launch for her She Pivots podcast. And then I had the pleasure of going to Susan McPherson's um, amazing rooftop and learning more about your new book. And so I really want to talk about like the nitty gritty of your book because I honestly learned so much that day. Um, and your book is called The Setback Cycle. And so for anyone who hasn't already listened to it, read it, all the things you need to, I feel like that day when we were at Susan's place and basically for those of you who weren't there, which is probably most of you, um, 
you know, we went around the deck and everybody sort of shared their setback. And that really got me interested in talking to you because the types of setbacks people shared were so different. Um, given your past work with so many different companies like Google and like you said, Forbes, I just assumed it would be so business oriented and it just was really, really vast in terms of the things that people had been through and, and the topics that you cover in your book. So I just wanted to start out by saying that. And I'd love to just get to know you a little bit more and learn just for starters, what had you decide to write a book about setbacks? So like you said, it definitely started because of all the business setbacks I was seeing or really people's personal setbacks that led them to start a business kind of like yourself. You know, these setbacks, maybe they lead to professional gain in some way, but they're not always born of professional loss. And I noticed that every time I interviewed someone for usually my Forbes col column or a couple folks for a Harvard Business Review Fast Company, I, I freelance all over the place. But every time I interviewed someone and I asked about their career journey or what led them to whatever thing they were most proud of building, it always came down to what they created after coming out of a setback. So they were on one path, they were moving forward, working towards a goal, and they were unexpectedly bumped backwards. And it was always the thing that they had to reroute and kind of that other path that they found in the process that led them to somewhere even better than where they were originally going. And I was seeing this everywhere, everywhere. And I was like, do we just have drama or is this really <laughs> happening? Like, what is going <laughs> on? Maybe both. But I was also kind of like, why has no one written about this? Or I tried to find some sort of explanation for it. I read all these business psychology books. I was reading like academic papers. I mean, I was in the weeds because not everything fell under the categories that I understood. Like, not everything was post-traumatic growth because not every setback was a trauma, you know, and not everything fell under learning from your mistakes because not every setback was their mistake. And so it wasn't until I came upon the definition of a setback, which is a reversal or check in progress, when I realized, oh, this is what's happening. So whether it is like an extreme trauma, like deeply, deeply tumultuous situation that leads them somewhere, or even just like the micro everyday setbacks that people experience or the setbacks that every entrepreneur experiences every day in trying to create a company. Like that's what it was. That's the umbrella term for everything I was seeing. And once I identified it, I went and started talking to people and interviewing experts, executive coaches, neuroscientists, psychologists to really kind of uncover why this was happening and how people could best work through it once they identified it. Oh, wow. I love that so much. And can you say the definition just one more time? Because I feel like it was like baked in there and I want to make sure that people really get it. Oh, yeah. A, a setback is defined as a reversal or check in progress. And it is on the very first page of the book. Oh, like, oh, that's what oh, I do. So check in progress. Okay. Because yeah. I want people to really understand what it is. Yeah. Because the point of the book is that you start to see your own life experiences through this lens and you have a deeper understanding of what you've been through and what you will inevitably go through. And to just start with the basic definition of what a setback is, it just helps ground the, the concept that we explore. Yeah, I feel more grounded hearing that actually, because I remember when we did our, you know, circle of everyone going around and saying what their setbacks were, I, I am like just a very positive person by nature. So I always like, I don't believe in like toxic positivity, but I personally do really try to frame things in my life as like, okay, what can I learn? What can I get from this? How can I grow? And so when we said setback, I remember everyone was going around and I sort of was like, well, I don't think of this as a setback, but I'm going to tell you all like, and I shared about my health journey a little bit and what had me start chronic on. But it's interesting the way that you say that. And have you heard that from people? Like, do people think of setback as like a super negative thing? And are we thinking of it kind of the wrong way, I guess you could say? It depends on the person. But yeah. I think that everyone I've spoken to or everyone I've heard from who has read the book always say to me like, oh, my God, 
I never realized this thing I went through was a setback, but now after reading your book, I realize that it was, or I realize, you know, I'm in a setback right now and I hadn't really put a, a term to what I was currently going through. And now you've really like clarified that for me. I think, first of all, I have a whole like section on toxic positivity and how it kind of came. I, my theory is that toxic positivity came from the concept of positive psychology, which is a very noble concept. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that is absolutely legit. And I think that people just took it a little too far. And that's kind of how we got to this like toxic positivity era, which I think we're actually coming out of. But I have a whole section on that, which I feel like you'll appreciate. But I I don't, I don't love when people say like a setback is a negative experience or a setback actually can be a positive experience Mm -hmm. because it can be both. It can be neither. Um, It's usually both. It's, it's not like I'm trying to say like, Hey, I want you all to go through some terrible thing or experience pain or suffering. I don't want Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. However, I do have some proof that when you experience setbacks again they don't have to be the most extreme pain and suffering they can be the micro setbacks that just make you reroute and think creatively and try to problem solve and like use that more innovative centric part of your brain to get you to somewhere new that part can be very rewarding the aftermath of a setback can be very positive but it's not positive when you're going through it yeah, and I I believe in that nuance. And that's actually something that we talk about a lot in Chronicon and the work that I'm doing. It's like, yes, pe- I've learned so much from having a chronic illness and going through all the things that I've been through. And there are days that it just absolutely sucks. Totally. And I'm just in totally. true pain. And that is what it is, you know? So I love that you make so much room for that nuance because I do think that is like toxic positivity is out and like nuance is very in. Yeah. Um, so I, I really love that. And I'd love to also learn, and I know you share about this in the book, so I'm sure, you know, for those of you who are going to read it, hopefully all of you afterwards, um, you know, you you can leave a little for the imagination. But I'd love to know if there's like a setback you could share with us from your own life. I know you've interviewed so many people in the book with all different types of setbacks, but is there something that you really felt like, oh, like this was my setback moment? It's so funny you ask that because the biggest thing that I have learned on, not not in writing the book, a little bit in writing the book, but the biggest thing I've learned in this, let's call it like the book marketing phase when I've been going on podcasts and news outlets to talk about the book, the biggest thing I've learned is how much people care about my story. I wrote this book because I was inspired by the stories of others and I have like really famous people in here and other people who maybe you haven't heard of who are just so fascinating and so brilliant. And I was prepared to go on all these interviews and tell you guys about them because they're so cool. And I did all this research and and really extracted the messy middle of their stories. But everyone is asking about my story. It's like so funny to me. you, Amy? You're so cool. And you've done so many amazing things. Like we want to know. I want to know about your setback. Of course. And so I did write about my own setback in the book. And what is so funny is that as I was doing all this research, as I was becoming what I am now known as like the setback expert. And this whole time I was doing this, I was working through my own professional setback because when I started this book journey, it was right after I had my daughter and my professional setback was coming back from maternity leave after only 12 weeks. I only got 12 weeks and being totally sidelined in my career, being totally cast aside ignored, disregarded, being removed from accounts. I had worked to help build and I took so much pride in. And I was just told like, "Eh, the people who replaced you are going to run those accounts now. And I was like, okay, so what am I going to do? And there was just no answer to that. So it's not a coincidence that my freelance journalism career really skyrocketed in that same time period. And I took all of my energy and ambition and I, I put it towards all the things I did outside of my day job. And that was, you know, me writing this book was me working through my professional setback, me me seeking answers to what I was experiencing. It's not really that surprising that I was drawn to these stories and drawn to the, oh, how'd you work through that? Because I was trying to work through mine the whole time. And I didn't realize it until like 
the day I handed it, two days after I handed in my manuscript when I was unsurprisingly laid off, <laughs> I was like, okay, being laid off is not the setback. Like, I feel fine about this. Like, I have been ready for this. And I was just totally prepared. And I was, you know, I was already consulting on the side. I had formed my LLC because I didn't ignore the signs. And that's the biggest learning of going through a setback. Don't ignore mm -hmm. it. When I was sidelined, it wasn't a big dramatic thing. It was very subtle. It was very, very subtle. I almost didn't think it was happening. I was like, eh, I'm like making this up in my head. Like, this is actually fine. I still have a job. Who am I to complain? Like, everything's fine. Everyone's being so nice to me. Like, everything's great. Everything was not great. No one around me believed that I was fine. They all told me later. And it took, it took another colleague of mine who came up to me and said, I saw what happened to you. That wasn't cool. I am leaving this place because I want to become a mom one day and I don't want what happened to you to happen to me. And I was like, oh my God, like not only did I not make the situation better for myself, I didn't make it better for the people who came after me, which was like, yes, of course, it's not like totally on me to do that. But like it didn't, I felt, I felt a level of responsibility. It, it didn't feel good. So that's when I got more vocal about it. I you know, told my manager at the time, I told the people around me, I just started talking about it. And you know, it was uncomfortable. Like no one wanted to hear this, but it was, you know, and again, there were no like villains in the story. It was just like assumptions were made and decisions were made for me, not with me. And it was, um, you know, it led to me having a career setback. And so my biggest piece of advice is number one, don't ignore the signs of your setback. Even if you don't totally abandon whatever you've been working on, lay the foundation for your next chapter, right? While you're in the, the first chapter. And also, your story is important. People care about your story, no matter what you think. So. Mm. Wow. That's such a powerful story. And the thing that's really kind of standing out to me and everything that you shared is the part about you sort of gaslighting yourself, you know, <laughs> thinking like, and I say it that way because I have definitely oh, totally. done that. I mean, th this is sort of silly, but I always say the first sign that someone has COVID is that they are in denial that they have COVID because I feel like everyone is always, I'm just, I just have allergies. I'm mm -hmm. not really sick. It's fine. Yeah. But I felt that way when I got um, diagnosed with this rare neuromuscular disease from getting COVID in, in 2021, 2022. Wow. And I had no idea what was going on, but I kept being like, I'm sure it's just long COVID. I'm sure I'll be fine. It's not a big deal. I am so tough and like still somehow figure out a way to look cute. I will be fine. <laughs> like it's just like the whole time I was just really in denial about yeah, it. That and is I, so and common. It's so common. What is that? Is that because society has sort of trained us not to believe ourselves or is it because we put too much pressure on ourselves or all of the above? It's all of the above. We, so I can get into the four phases of the setback cycle. Yeah, phase I one is actually a, was going to ask you about that because I know the, that there's like a whole trajectory. I want you to tell course. us everything. Well, okay. it, 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 I want to get into it because it actually answers your question. Okay. Why do we do this? Okay. So phase one of the setback cycle is establish because as you, as evidence in your and my story, it takes some of us a while to establish we're in a setback. Because we want to ignore the signs or we want to just pretend that everything is fine and move forward because it's easier to continue on the trajectory you're on than admit that something's wrong and completely reroute and start something new. So we think, but you're actually closer if you finally, if you finally acknowledge that you're in a setback or oh, you finally acknowledge yes. that path number one is not working. You're actually closer in that rerouting and shifting, which is like, it's hard, but you're actually closer to getting on the right track if you acknowledge it sooner. If you keep barging forward on a path that is no longer serving you, you're still far, you're going to have to reroute at some point. So why not just do it now? Or at least you don't have to blow up your life to reroute, whether it's leaving a job or leaving a relationship, or again, just acknowledging the moment you're in. It just start to t to sort of acknowledge the clues and admit the moment you're in and lay the foundation for what might be next. So mm -hmm. establish is like a whole thing. And I have a little alarm clock checklist it, intended to wake you up if you think you're like unconsciously floating into one. Um, so now to answer your question, the second phase of the setback cycle is embrace. And this is the hardest phase because it requires that we get uncomfortable. 
And as a society, we have been conditioned to avoid discomfort. Go back to your toxic positivity. Like we all want to pretend that everything is fine because we think it's easier. We think we're strong. We can barge through. We can press on. We, you know, but you don't have to. That's the thing. Like you don't have to. You can acknowledge when something's wrong. And I do think as a society, we are moving a little bit more in that direction, but it's still, it's still hard. And like I said, I'm the setback expert, but when I find myself in one, I do still have the instinct to want to fast forward or want to ignore. And I catch myself all the time, Mm. all the time. So this is just human. This is just human. We think it's easier to to avoid discomfort. Um, But again, if we go to my, what did you say? I said, and then you have two more steps. So this is like the first half, basically, is like the first half. Sort of, yeah, like getting real about where you're at, acknowledging what's happening, starting to embrace, even if you're fighting it tooth and nail. That's and right. Then, That's and right. Then you're gonna go. So once you are finally there and you've embraced your setback and you've like gathered the information and you are ready to kind of do that little like, okay, I'm here. Let's pave the foundation for what's next. That's when you move into phase three, which is explore. And this is the best phase because you are just playing with what's possible and you're not committing to anything yet. This is a fun phase. It's when you get to figure out what your superpower is. You figure out what's the intersection of my passion with my strength and how can I use that as I move into my next chapter. You can, this is where we rely on our community and we start to test out new ideas and we connect with people who you know, maybe we don't know that well, but we, uh, you know, we think they're doing something similar to what we want to do, or they might be able to help us, or we might be able to learn from them. Like, this is the most fun part. Then once you get the clarity you need, and you kind of like have your, your plan all set, you move into emerge and emerge is the fourth and final phase of the setback cycle. It is your glorious, you know, butterfly, your, your metamorphosis is complete moment, but it's not without its own challenges. You know, how many of you love like a new year's resolution kind of moment where you're like, okay, here's what I'm going to do in the new year. I'm going to drink more water. I'm going to get up earlier. I'm going to be more productive, whatever it is. And then you get to January 1st or 2nd, whenever you're going to start that thing. And you're like, oh, now I have to go do the thing I said I was going to do. So that that can happen in the emerge phase. You're like, you're kind of tired from working through the setback cycle. It's an energy intensive process. And so when you get to that emerge phase, your plan is clear. But going from planning into action has its whole host of challenges. And I, I have a couple exercises in the book that can help you kind of like move past those barriers. But Yep. But then you mm-hmm. emerge and you can finally step forward and you you go into your next chapter and and best of all you're prepared for any future setbacks that come your way because once you've been through the cycle, you know how to work through it again. Yeah, that's so helpful. I love that you have it mapped out that way because as you're sort of describing all these different phases, I can definitely see different times in my life where, especially the explore phase, I thought of the time right before I created Chronicon, I had a huge setback and I've talked about it on the podcast before where I was in like the beauty space. I'd had my own talk show, all these things on in media. And I was like, I don't think I'm supposed to talk to people about eye cream anymore. Like, what is going on? Like, I love a good eye cream. And I just don't think that this is like my calling, you know? And I, through the explore phase, I, I actually played this game where I would go to different events and like networking things or stuff for work. And I would introduce myself as something different every single time I went to see what like felt like the most resonant. It's actually the best thing that I could have done because I introduced myself like as a talk show host, as a blogger, as a content creator. And then I also introduced myself as um, a chronic illness advocate. And I had never done that before. And every time I said chronic illness advocate, I just got chills all over my body saying that. Um, I, I would get a different reaction than every single thing, every other thing that I did, even though everything was always true. So I really love that. And then in your book, you basically in each phase have different stories of people. Mm -hmm. So what are some of, I mean, I'm sure you can't play favorites because I'm sure they're all perfect and amazing, but what are some of the, like maybe the one or two stories that really just kind of stick out to you where you're like, okay, this is such a clear 
picture of this setback cycle and it might help people who are sort of thinking about their own setbacks right now. Yeah. One of my favorite ones to talk about in interviews, because I feel like it fully illustrates the four phases, is that of Norma Kamali. She's an iconic fashion designer. She's been in the industry for about 50 years. She's in her 70s, and she has just had one of the most, I think, longest running and most successful fashion careers in in history. And when she was first starting out, she was married very young. And in the 60s and 70s, she thought that it was best to let her husband run the finances of her business. So she was a fashion designer. She had a store, um, I think it was like on 58th Street, and she had her husband handle the finances. Now, Norma was an introvert. Her husband was an extrovert. He went out all the time. He spent a lot of their finances on his, you know, partying habits. And there was also quite a bit of infidelity. Norma started to catch on to this and she wasn't sure of what to do because she wasn't only married to him. She was, he was her business partner. So it was like very tricky to just sort of like get out of, you know, and so, and she's young, like she didn't know what to do. And she, she told me that there's always one moment where you're so grateful because everything becomes just super clear and your next steps become super clear. And that moment for her was when one of the women that her husband was cheating on her with came into her store, came in, into the back, into her workstation, started talking to her. I think she started like directing her on how to design clothing or something that, you know, it was deeply upsetting for Norma. And in that exact moment, the ceiling crashed down over her workstation. Like literally? Literally. The ceiling crashed down. And so Norma said, if there was ever a sign to leave, it was that. And with $98 to her name, she walked out of the business, out of her marriage. She got her own apartment. She had like one mattress. That was it. And she just completely started over. She started asking for help. Do you have fabrics? Do you know of a sewing machine I could borrow? And she just, you know, obviously she was devastated. Like I'm not really talking too much about her her embrace phase, but I, I am talking about the moment where she had to stop pretending it was fine. And she left. It gave her the signal she needed to leave. And Her explore phase was just like, what am I good at? What can I do? And it was, you know what? I'm really good at designing clothing. I'm just going to do that again. She did. Three years later, she created a new business called OMO on my own. And that morphed into the global million dollar, billion dollar brand that she now runs today. Wow, Amy. It's a good one, right? That is like... Wow. No. That is incredible. I mean, my whole spirit is just like, I don't know, thinking of all my ancestors, thinking of all the women that have come before me, thinking of all the things that so many women from generations and generations have had to, you know, just carry bullshit on their backs. I feel like is really is really the thing. And I even, I mean, I definitely resonate with that. There's been so many times where I've had to sort of be like, okay, I know I'm supposed to be playing small here according to society or according to the patriarchy or according to traditional values, but I am actually going to be very loud right now. Yeah. And I'm actually going to do the opposite. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of going through one of those spaces right now personally um, as well. And and it's it's so awkward so awkward (laughs) and it just kind of makes me feel like uh I'm assuming that this is gonna be okay on the other end but no one really knows until you emerge I guess well now you know that you will emerge you absolutely will emerge and I have like a whole workbook at the back of the book that you can go through if that helps you It, it just recaps all of the exercises and there's not a lot you know there's only like two or three per phase yeah so it's people have been using it to do like business planning <laughs> yeah, and just like to, to reset, to reset. If they feel like they're in a funk, like you might not even be in a setback, but they, if they feel like they're just not sure of how to move forward, they've been doing the workbook. <laughs> like yeah. telling me about it. It's amazing. But I, I, I do want people to know that no matter the low you are in, or no matter the confusion or like murkiness that you might find yourself in, like your path ahead will become clear. It might take a long time. You cannot fast forward the setback cycle, but you will emerge and you will be so amazed 
by how capable you are. You will be so amazed. I promise you. I promise you. And if here's another thing, I just um I just gave a TEDx talk um in in Washington DC this weekend and in it, you know, I do talk about my own setback and I I talk about how there will always be people in your life who make you feel like you need to prove yourself. For me, there have been people who have cast doubt on my intelligence or my capability for many reasons. I think mostly because I'm like talkative and bubbly and smile a lot. I'm a woman. Oh, I so can like, oh, yeah, of course. Everyone can relate. Um, <laughs> but some people unconsciously equate that with a lack of intelligence and make me feel like I have to prove myself over and over and over. And there will always be those people. But there will also be other people who counter. So you can you can create a narrative based on how those people make you feel. And I call that your self-doubt narrative. And if you if you move forward and you create an identity based on your self-doubt narrative, you will find the proof to support it. But if you create a counter argument, you can find new proof points if you turn to your community. You turn to the people who see you more clearly than you see yourself, who know how capable you are. You ask them, like, what am I really good at? What do I bring to, you know, the cocktail party? What do I bring to an environment, you know, outside of just like whatever skills I've developed in my professional career? Like, who am I? And like, why are you friends with me? And you will like, if you start asking those questions and you start to see yourself through the eyes of the people around you, you will create a counter argument to that self-doubt narrative. And I had to, I was giving this talk and I felt like, who am I to be giving a TEDx talk? And then I was like, maybe I should listen to my talk and remember that like the people around me are like, no, you're very prepared for this. You've been talking about the setback cycle for quite some time. You'll be fine. Um, and so, yes, I, I also have to kind of listen to my own advice. It's not yeah. Good. Wow. I, I really appreciate that, though, because the thing that it brings up for me, which I, I do feel like is a little complicated sometimes is I've been looking at my stories and my narratives just around my health and how so many people who are dealing with their health on a significant level, it's it's really easy for not only does my body have symptoms, right? So that's like one dimension. Sure. But then I find that I also, because I've had chronic illnesses for so long and I got them so young too, there's also like this coat that I wear with it, which is like the story that I have that reinforces the dis-ease, the illness, all of that stuff, which is outside of, like we were saying when we first started, the nuance, right? Yeah. Yes, there is pain or challenge with this con this condition. That is real. I've never said that that isn't. But then what are the extra stories that I'm doing and saying to myself and that I'm needing people to help me reinforce it and mm -hmm. all of those things like you're talking about? Um, it feels tricky to go there sometimes because I never want anyone to feel like we're diminishing the reality of their experience. I wouldn't want anyone to do that to me either, right? But there's something there. And I yeah. do, I mean, the people in my community know it's been brewing for a while. And I think there's a lot of really big work we're meant to do around that. But I love that you talk about that. And it does feel like very tangible because then you can sort of take it step by step to really have things shift and not have it feel like so esoteric, you yeah. know? It's true. It's yeah. true. Yeah. I love that so much, Amy. I'm so glad I could talk to you forever. I'm I so know. glad that we had a chance to chat today. Well, one question that I always ask people um, every interview is what does thriving look like for you? To me right now, thriving looks like taking a beat and regrouping and like relaxing a little bit after the whirlwind yeah. that I have had. I have been so lucky and I have received so much abundance and support and success, traditionally defined success around the launch of this book. Like I got all the accolades, all the thing, you know, bestseller, TEDx, cool, 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 all these things. But right now that, you know, it's been six weeks of that. And now I am like home and I'm not traveling for a while. And the last two days, I just got to like hang out with my daughter and Aww. go to the park and just, you know, have time to chill mm -hmm. and not feel like, oh, I have to be doing more for the book launch. I have to be doing more to prepare for this talk. Like I'm on the other side of it. And I'm so happy by how successful it was. And now I'm so happy for this more simple moment 
Um, and so to me, thriving looks like relaxing and finding balance and, and reorganizing. I love that. You so deserve it. I have so many friends that have written books and it is just, it's hands down. It continues to be one of the hardest things I think anyone can do professionally. So I'm really glad that you're taking that time for yourself and getting to reconnect with your daughter and spend that time. And also I'm thinking, I'm like, if I ever write a book, which I'm planning to at some point, I need to time it the way that you did. Cause now it's going to be the summer. I, <laughs> I, lo- I know. <laughs> I mean, I know. done in the winter and then you have like all these cold like gross months and you know it's not that fun to be kind of taking a rest no. um I really love that for you I'm so happy that you're doing that I'm so happy that we got a chance yeah. to chat today I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and um yeah thank you for being on thriving together oh this was such a wonderful conversation thank you so much